Okay, I think we'll begin um, since time is uh, always um, uh, tight. <laughs> uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Greenwich Penn Women Parat Memorial Library book discussion of Isabel Wilkerson's wonderful uh, book, which you can't <laughs> see because of my background, I apologize, um, The Warmth of Other Suns. Um, it's uh, really a great read. If you haven't read it yet, hopefully after tonight, you uh, will want to pick up a copy and, and read it. Um, I'm going to hand over the meeting now to Lee Payne, who is the president of Greenwich Pen Women. Lee? Thank you so much, Judy. Uh, we are so grateful to be able to coordinate and collaborate with the Parat Library on these series of book discussion groups. It's been a great joy. And I'd like to thank Diane Morello, who is with us tonight, uh, for coordinating that on our end and Judy coordinating on the Parat end. I'd also like to welcome all those who are joining us uh, for the first time tonight. Um, just a little uh, bit about the Greenwich Pen Women. We are one of the two largest branches in the country of the National League of American Pen Women, which is centered in Washington, D.C. And we're a group of professional women who are uh, writers, you would know from the title, but also artists and musicians, uh, specifically composers. If you uh, or someone you know could be interested in joining us, you can go to our website, which is www greenwichpenwomen.org and um, you'll find about everything you'd like to know about us there I think. Um, it's been a delight to uh, do these and we look forward to doing more so please put these on your calendar when you see them and uh, we look forward to having you join us. Thank you so much. And now um, I'd like to introduce Adrian Reedy and Lynn Garlick of the Greenwich Pen Women, who will be leading our discussion tonight. Okay, thank you, uh, Adrian. I guess I'll go first. Yeah, right. go ahead. And, okay, then I'll get. You. We're going to have a little discussion. Um, um, Adrian and I spoke earlier today. In fact, we spoke a few days ago, and a few other emails and what have you and how we uh, felt about this book. And uh, I just reviewed that it was March 22nd of 2021 that Adrian and I led this group in the discussion of CAST, Isabel Wilkerson's second book, which came out in 2020. Uh, Warmth of Other uh, Sons came out in 2010. When I finished CAST and then we had this discussion and everything, I immediately got Warmth of, under sun, uh, of Other Sons and read it immediately. And then uh, we were engaged again, Adrian and I, to lead this group tonight. So I reread the book in the last couple of weeks. And I have to tell you, it just, this book and Isabel Wilkerson is such a wonderful writer, a spirit, a soul that is just truly from God. And she tells the story of the great migration of the black people, the African American people from the Jim Crow South. And in her book, she describes how terribly dangerous it was. And that was one of the motivators, but we'll get into this in our discussion. So for myself, it hit, just hit me in my heart and my mind. And full disclosure here, uh, several things about the book that hit me, but that'll come out in our discussion, but I can relate to it. This is kind of crazy, but I'm a migrant too, born and raised in Hawaii, and uh, we migrated. My parents sold everything, and we just migrated, took a chance, and moved to the mainland, and why did we do that? We did that because I was in public school and was under physical threat. It was very dangerous. And that is why we migrated to San Francisco and I was in the ninth grade. So when I read these stories, you know, I, I get it a bit about the migrant and why you migrate. There are really good reasons why these people migrated for several reasons, both physical danger, needs, soul, psychological, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this story, this book tells the story of three migrants and Isabel Wilkerson, I watched a YouTube podcast by her today. 
she talks about the soul of the migrant and why they migrated. And it really brought the book alive for me again this afternoon. So that is my initial reaction to the book, my thinking about it, about Isabel Wilkerson, who I think is an incredible person. If I had the pleasure of meeting her someday, I'd be most thankful. So Adrian, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you discuss your reaction and then we'll throw this out to our audience. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Lynn. This is, this is, it's been a, it's been a very, um, I've enjoyed being on the journey with you. Yeah. Um, However, <laughs> uh, reading the book for me, I have to share, um, it was tough. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. It was just downright tough because you see, my, my, my folks were born in New Jersey, but my grandparents on both sides, my father's um, uh, parents were born and raised in Alabama. Oh boy. And my mother's parents were, were raised in Goldsboro, North Carolina. So when I started reading this book, I have to tell you, I went through a very tough time. Mm -hmm. And I remember like talking, you know, I read Cass, but there was something about this book. All of a sudden, I really felt my grandparents' pain and struggle and I felt the struggle of my parents in a way that I had not experienced before. And um, so this great migration, I am, you know, thankfully, uh, I, 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 I didn't grow up in the South, but it gave me a deeper understanding of some of the stories that I heard from my own, my own, within my own family. So for me, this book was hard. I, I, and I am a, a, a woman of faith and I'm a woman of, of hope, great hope. Mm -hmm. And the only reason why I would even want to have these conversations is because I believe that by having these conversations, you know, that, that we have the, the opportunity to do something with this. And so I hope that in our conversation, you know, you understand that this was hard reading for me. Yeah. Very difficult. Because Lynn, I don't know if, if like, for me, I cannot understand how a person could just, just oppress and just dislike another human being and do everything in their power to keep, to continue to, to oppress the individual from being able to, to make something of themselves and to be able, for me, like my mind and my heart, I cannot, in my mind, I can't conceive it. I can't comprehend it in my heart. I, I just, I, I don't know how another human being can, can, can do that to, to another human being. You know what I mean? I certainly do. Yeah. And especially if one human being is trying to help out another yeah. and then they get attacked themselves for trying to help someone who's in trouble. Yeah. Just incredible. I think what got to us on this, uh, Adrian, is that she zeroes in on three specific people so that we can relate to them as a human being, someone that's right here by us telling us their story. Yeah. And I think it, it gets so personal and so close that if it doesn't hit your heart, you're not alive. I just, right. I just don't get it, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I can see where you're coming from, that you're a descendant of these Absolutely. brave people, you know, that got Absolutely. out of the Jim Crow South. Right. And I think Isabel Wilkerson just makes this so vivid and so alive through these so three real. characters. Yes. You know, Ida May, Brandon, um, what was her name? Glad it. Yeah, Ida May. Ida May. Let's call her yeah. Ida May. Uh huh. You know, they lead, she's a new bride. Yeah. She's a new bride. Her husband's cousin, I believe, was beaten because they couldn't find the sharecropper yeah. owner's turkeys. Right. I mean, and he was innocent. That's what I mean. That's why the, the whole The bloody. whole thing. Yeah. 
it just yeah. it's the how people can just act no reason at all except for the color of your skin really that's what you're about. and ownership and jim crow south was a very dangerous place yeah well let's open this up okay to uh to have this conversation right. and um I hope that the people who talk, I love to have these conversations and I love to be able yeah. to see your faces. Yeah. I think that if you can can just open up and take yourself off, put yourself so that we can see you. Put your face up. Your face up so that we can see you and have some good face-to-face -face conversation. We're in this together. And I just really wanna, I want to um, make sure that we have some rules here that this is a safe place to have this conversation, that everything, if you see me getting upset, I'm not upset at you. <laughs> yeah. I'm simply upset at the story and what happened. And I'm hoping that as we have this conversation, we together can be a part of something that makes a difference, a change. So that to me, this is a kind of book that everybody should read. Yes. Really. I agree. You, know, you have all these people who are fighting about, you know, different books that we should be putting on the shelf indefinitely. This is a book that everyone should read. But anyway, so welcome. Um, our, our, our first question that we wanted to talk about was, um, you know, in many ways, the, the warmth of, of other sons, it, it tells, it's a, 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 an old story in a new way for us, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, about the great migration of the Southern Blacks. And to set the, the record straight about the true significance of that migration. So what are the most surprising revelations? I was sharing my revelation with you is that for me, it just hit too close to home. Mm -hmm. But what were some of the surprising revelations that you had in this book? I'd, I'd love to hear. Um, those who read it, like, were, were you surprised? What'd you think? Um, I, for me, um, when she points out uh, the fact that the, many of these families who came from the South, um, they had strong marriages, they were hardworking, they um, were industrious, they didn't get into drugs or sink to, to, to drinking. Um, they were, you know, at, uh, admirable citizens. And I have a good friend uh, uh, who is a librarian, a black uh, woman, and she, her family comes from North Carolina and they um, moved to Connecticut from North Carolina. And her family, if I describe her family, it's exactly what I just said in terms of, you know, the hardworking and, the, and, and, and good people. And um, so for me, it was, it was very enriched because I had Blanche, I had the feeling, the thought of Blanche in my head while I was reading these stories. And it goes against, you know, this, the suggestion that it was the people who came from the South who brought with them, you know, problems of, of drugs and poverty and that kind of thing. And indeed, a lot of that was already here, uh, was in right. the North, you know? And, and the other thing, as awful and God, it, God awful as it was in the South, in the Jim Crow South, it was in your face, you know, uh, whites here, colored is what the term that they use, colored go here. But in the North, they didn't have those signs, but they had, it was in cities, you know, it, it, it was there. Um, it just wasn't on the surface. Right. And so, um, and indeed, some would argue, and many would argue it still is in, in, in mm -hmm. many areas. So that's what I found interesting. Very good. Very Terry, good. I saw your hand raised and I saw, is it Palma Jean Sloan? I saw your hand. So why don't we go with Terry first and then we'll go over to you, Sloan. Okay. Um, well, I was raised in the South in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 49. So um, I, well, I left, I left. <laughs> um, I was moved. Uh, 
so much by it. I mean, I knew so much, but I guess what surprised me was how hard it was in the North that the Blacks, I mean, what they were dealing with immigrants coming from Europe, but also Blacks that had been there who resented them. And the whole um, and, um, adjustment, I mean, the, the accent, I mean, how Jesse Owens got his name because the teacher just heard JC and just yeah. heard Jesse. And um, th that, I mean, I, I'm still there uh, in the maybe two thirds of the way through, but um, it's, it's moved me a, a lot. Cause I mean, I've thought so much about how my upbringing, I mean, I, I was raised in a very liberal Catholic family that um, actually our priest in high school took us around the neighborhood in a school bus, didn't say anything, but all of a sudden we looked and saw every house was for sale and he, we learned about redlining and stuff. Um, but um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a sobering thing. I think this book explains a lot about what's happening um, in our country today of the mixture of uh, immigrants and I mean, the race situation is very complicated. I'm a China expert and the, the treatment of Chinese Americans is so terrible too. Um, of course, they weren't allowed in the country during all this time until end of the war. Oh, or two. But anyway, yeah, it was very powerful. It's very powerful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Is it is it Palma Jean? Mm -hmm. Palma Jean, you were muted. muted. You're muted. Still can't hear you. You still yeah, muted. <laughs> you gotta unmute. I know. It there only she is. Few tries. I'm sorry. Um, Pam right. is my name, Pam. more commonly. Um, oh, right. You asked Adrian what surprised us about the book. That's right. And I think what surprised me most personally was that I knew so little about this, about the full story. I knew about the migration, but very, very minimally. And I think the best part of the book for me was the fact that um, the surprise for me was to, to feeling so close to the three sets of people that she described. I, I felt like I got to know them and feel for them. And I just felt so horrible seeing what they were experiencing and recognizing that it is not uncommon today. Right. And that's the saddest part that we haven't grown and we haven't learned and we haven't learned to understand because we're still putting people in those boxes and preventing good people from becoming part of society and adding to it. They wanted to work. They were given the most horrible menial jobs. They were forced to kind of deny their own culture, which was very rich, rich in family, rich in faith. And yet that was not allowed for them. They were looked down upon for that by people in the neighborhoods where they were forced to live and often under conditions that while they may have been somewhat better than they were in the South, they were certainly not decent by any means. And they continue to deteriorate. So uh, yeah. it, was a, it was a brilliantly written book and I agree that it must be read by many people. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yes. Who else? Did someone else raise yeah. their hand? Else? Yes, Sandy. You're, you're, there okay. you go. Um, I did not read the book. However, I will read the book, but I did read her first book and attended many uh, programs where she spoke and other people spoke. And basically when you take a look at the um, racism and lack of empathy and struggle for recognition, and not to be looked at as the other. This is really the story of every single immigrant class that has come to the United States. I mean, the story of the blacks, you have to go back to 1619, if you really want to understand fully 
I, I think I think what you're what you 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 you're saying something that that's very important. I but I think I really want to keep this conversation about the book and it's the great migration about the African American experience. Well, the one thing that I can say without even having read the book, that it's a struggle for primacy. People that left the South in any story of migration, and I'm pretty sure that it's a story of control. Right. The yeah. reason why people in the book were treated the way they were is because they, if they remained downtrodden, others could have more control and feel themselves superior to. And I think that with all of the three stories, as you read, as you have read, you probably saw elements of this. And um, as I said, I look forward to reading the book and I look forward to comments. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you, much, Adrian. Was there anyone else? I don't, let me just go on the second page here. Okay. Should There's Betty, Betty McCarsky. Okay. Oh, all right. There we go. I see you, Betty. Hi. Hi. So in answer to your question, what was my biggest surprise? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with, I can't remember who said it. I think Pam said it, how little I knew about the Great Migration, but my biggest surprise about the Great Migration is the length of time it lasted. Right. Yeah, and, and in that time scheme, I'm able to to relate to it a little bit more than it, you know, than because I lived the end of it. So I know people that I lived in the South for some time. I lived in Central Florida, and. I get very emotional and almost ashamed that the people that lived in the part of the country that I lived in just a few years earlier could have been so terrible and inhum inhumane, you know, to to the African Americans and to yeah. the black people. I, I that was the, my biggest surprise. I think was how long it it lasted, how many years, and and with what great passion these people moved. And then how they were drawn back, even with the danger of going back south to visit their family, to mm -hmm. have that, those grits or those biscuits or whatever it yeah. was that, that brought the family together, the church, whatever, the funerals, they went back for the funerals. That's right. Oh, gosh. So, so but then the, the, to, to bring it to positive, for me anyway, at the very end, I was really able to connect again because the time period, I, I'm surprised that it lasted so long when Ida Mae saw Obama in the church basement. Yeah. Yeah. That really brought it home for me. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she got to vote for him. And she got to vote for him. Yeah. Right. She, and she was so grateful because she never would have had the chance right. South to even go vote. Yeah. And that is one of the critical issues that is happening today with yeah. the, these movements to suppress the vote. And they are largely in the southern states for the most part. Yeah. So that good, good call, Betty, because yeah. I think that's where it hit. It came right to the in our face. What's happening now? And right. I may metal got to go vote for Obama, and she was so proud. Yeah. Um, and people are moving back to the south. I mean, the population yeah. in some of these southern cities, Atlanta is the great example. Georgia is a great example of you know how our democracy can work. And if you want to take it to that point, but um, it was a great story. It was a it was a, a fabulous book. And if anybody read Michelle Obama's book, yeah, when she the neighborhood that she lived in, she talks about how it changed, how it went from you know from being a nice place to live to where you know all the whites moved out, the white flight. So even she was affected by this, right. the end of the Great Migration. Yep. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Hey, Lynn, why don't you go ahead and I'll go on our next one? Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you all. Thank you, everybody. All right, let's move on. Uh, now we're going to get into the characters, the three characters. What motivated Ida Mae Gladney, 
George Starling and Robert Foster to leave the South? What circumstances and inner drives prompted them to undertake such a difficult and dangerous journey? What would likely have been their fates if they had remained in the South? To what ways did living in the North free them? Now that's a, several segments to that, to that question. So let's concentrate first on the first one, which is um, what circumstances and inner drives prompted them to undertake such a difficult journey? We're talking about the three main characters, Ida May, George Starling, and uh, Dr. Foster. Three very different stories. This is, speaking of misconceptions, this is one thing that I learned from the book is uh, Wilkerson uh, really divides it so that we know that the migration is in three major places, the East Coast, the Midwest, and the West Coast. See, being from the West Coast, that was a re revelation to me that actually there was a, a force coming in this migration to the West Coast as much as to the North or to the or to the Midwest. So at any rate, one of the things that I saw, so what do we think about George, Ida May, George and Robert Foster? What motivated them to leave the South? Well, for Ida May um, and her husband, it was the issue over the turkeys and yeah. the cousin um, was accused and they were fe they feared for their lives, basically. Yeah. I don't think Ida May was totally on board with leaving, but of course, when her husband um, kind of led the charge, she she went along. Um, for Robert, the um, he was a a very intelligent and ambitious uh, person, and he had his eyes set on California and he wanted a better life. He didn't want to have to live under Jim Crow and not be able to achieve all that he wanted to achieve in life. So he was looking for a better life in California. And I think George was um, at, under the threat of being lynched. Yes. I remember correctly. Um, so he you know, he was in danger. And that's why he left. Yeah. Yeah. The thing about George Starling is, and I find this in um, other characters, I've been reading uh, th these, the books have led me to the writings of Colson Whitehead. And it gives me a tremendous insight into how these people think and what motivates them. In George Starling, what was so sad there is he really wanted to advance his education in the South and he was limited to where he could go. And his father kept holding out the, the I'll pay for the tuition, but then he didn't pay, then he didn't pay, then he didn't pay. So George unfortunately tried to get back in by marrying, I guess, beneath himself in his father's eyes and then trying to advance, make money so he could go to school, he ended up in big trouble and he just had to get out of Dodge. Yeah. And the sad thing about that is how many, you know, here was a, a guy uh, who, who was extremely bright. Yeah. And um, probably his dad could not understand why he wouldn't want to go ahead and just get a job and make a little bit of money so that he would be able to contribute and didn't didn't have see the value right in education because that was what was imputed on him and so how many times does this happen and even even when we think about today what's what goes on in certain areas that don't have access to to good right. education and how many people are we missing? Exactly. Because for some reason, they're not valued. Therefore, education isn't a value there. And it just goes on. And I, I really felt for George because right. um, my grandfather was run out of North Carolina 
on my mother's father literally had to leave North Carolina because the Klan was after him. Oh. That's how we ended up in New Jersey. Oh. So, so George really like hearing his story, it just it, it brought such terror again. It's uh, a gut punch, yeah. Adrian, literally. Yeah. Spirits, you know, so anyway, but go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. So anybody, any thoughts on these three characters and their motivations? Well, the, the, do, the doctor didn't, couldn't get a job. They wouldn't let him practice. Right. And in yeah. California, they were a little more forward thinking, even though his clientele was, you know, um, mostly of color, but at least he was able to practice. Now, did that surprise you about what happened to him when he first went there, Dr. Foster? You know, the, the, it was the black people who- Wouldn't go see him. You remember that? Yeah. Did that surprise you? I've forgotten that. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's so interesting about the book is the complexity. Yes. Of, mm -hmm. of just even within the black race and then yes. the white race. I mean, and then immigrants, it, it's, that's why I feel like it's so today, it's just our situation is so complicated. It's not simply there's blacks here and whites here. There's all kind of blacks, there's all kind of whites, there's all kind of Chinese, there's all kind of that. And yeah, it, it, I was also struck by how the South Side of Chicago got really est established. Um, and um, yeah, Chicago being such a big part of our of politics and so, yeah. But I'm sorry about your grandfather. I, I grew up in Greensboro, not Goldsboro. Goldsboro was where the Air Force base is. But we kind of, um, I mean, in the South among whites, there's like feudal kind of stuff of poor whites and the, the rich whites that are Protestants and then the Catholics. We were kind of off to the side, uh, a little lesser. Mm -hmm. um, but see, our high school was integrated. And so in, in, the, in the mid 60s before the others. And so we played county teams. We were so small. And, and there had to be a uh, police there because we had blacks playing. Yeah. And um, at one time uh, we stopped on the way at a Howard Johnson or somewhere. And the priest got out first to see about, because we, we had blacks and whites. And the guy says, well, the whites can come in the front door and the blacks can come in the back door. And the priest says, no, they either all come in the front door or, or not. And I guess they didn't have much business that night. So we all went in, but it was scary. And right. at times the, yeah. the countryside of the South, the rural the cities have more of a veneer that everything is uh, okay. But um, yeah, sorry, talking to me. No, no, no that's great. No, no Thank please, you. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have some comments? There's Karen Royce and then there's Pam again. So why don't we start with Karen and then Pam will go to you, okay? You gotta unmute yourself, Karen. I was, I, was, I was struck when the speaker before was speaking that I think because I've taken sacred ground and I know there are some people on this call that have taken that series of classes I switched it around in my head and the police were there because there were white people there and their behavior. The people, the police, everyone thought they were there because there were black people, but that really wasn't why the police were there. They were there because white people were gonna come and do stuff. Mm. And I think we just always think about it in a certain way. And I didn't, I wasn't, raised in the South, but I did spend a very important summer of my life in 1969 in Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So I can relate to some of what's being said. But anyway, that's my comment about thank, per thank perspective. You, <laughs> thank you, Karen. Pam? Can't hear you, Pam. Unmute. 
unmute. You got to push that button hard. <laughs> okay. There you go. Uh, let's try three times. Sorry. I just was reacting um, when someone said we, the, there was the assumption that the black doctor, Dr. Foster, um, would be having black patients. And they were surprised, we were surprised that the black people in the neighborhood were not going to him. And I think that's a, a strange, that's a strange, that's an, a white assumption that because a person is black, then black people will go to them. And that's not a fair kind of assumption. Oh. And um, that's another way that we isolate by race. Well, yep. sure, there's a black doctor, so all the black people should go there, but why? Right. This is a new doctor mm -hmm. to start with. So there could be that justification for holding back a little bit until you get to know the person, regardless of the race. Anyway, yep. that was just something that jumped out at me when that was said. Thank you. Thanks. Go ahead, Lynn. Another part of this question is, um, what do you think would likely have happened to these three characters if they had remained in the South? Mm. Their stories okay. would have ended much sooner. I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they had a future in the South, a future of any, any imaginable um, security. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, I think um, Ida May's husband and George Starling mm -hmm. uh, were definitely in physical, you know, um, danger. Um, Dr. Foster, I think his was more ambition to, um, he didn't want to be stuck in um, just treating black people out in the country because they couldn't get, you know, any appointments in offices and everything. So I think he was probably the most actually ambitious in his wanting to migrate. Any thoughts on that, anybody? Uh, Ray, I can't remember exactly, but didn't Dr. Foster have a drinking and gambling problem? Didn't it, he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I would suspect that had he stayed in the South, that he would have, you know, found his end in that direction without the success of having a medicine to fall back on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he developed that problem later in life after he had established himself and had enough money to indulge in uh, the gambling in Las Vegas in particular. And I think that was looking at the grass on the other side of the fence where other physicians were going off to Las Vegas who were white. Mm -hmm. They could get into the casinos, but he couldn't. I think that's what irritated the heck out of him and why he wanted to go more than anything. Um, any other thoughts? Well, Lee had her hand up before. Lee, did you want to have a comment that you wanted to make? Well, it, it fits back uh, a bit in the discussion and it's not related uh, directly to the book, except that it, it sort of is, it's an it's historical uh, footnote that I experienced myself in hearing you. Um, discussing what happened in the book. And it's an unusual one that I haven't heard of anywhere else. In 1963, I got my first job teaching uh, high school English in New Rochelle High School. And um, the school was effectively segregated, not by law, but by practice, I guess you would say. There were college-bound kids and non-college-bound. And most of those in the not college-bound were African-American. And um, I had five classes uh, on that level for my first year and no books uh, whatsoever to work with them with. But one of the most surprising things to me was that um, I knew families, uh, black families had migrated to New Rochelle. It was, um, um, they felt they, their children would get the best education there. And so many families had come there and that was um, causing certain kinds of problems in New Rochelle. But 
most unusually, I discovered that there were a number of boys in my class who had no parents. They were not living with parents. They were, there were two different houses where these boys were boarding, supported by their parents who were still in the South. And uh, these boys were coming to school every day, wanting to know everything I could possibly teach them. And uh, not one of them ever caused a problem, but it was a shock to find a 15 year old, you know, several 15 year old boys uh, who quietly went about the business of trying to get an education that they'd been denied in the South because most of them couldn't really read on a, on a third grade level. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Lee. Yeah, yeah. Well, that speaks also then to um, the ambition of George Starling, who wanted to advance his education. And that was cut out from under him with, with getting into trouble with fighting, trying to establish unions or get more wages in the, in the groves where he was picking. That's where they threatened, got together and threatened to lynch him, I think. Um, in what ways did Billy and George free them? Let's put ourselves in Ida May up in Chicago, George Starling in New York, in Harlem, and Dr. Foster out in Los Angeles. Can um, I say something? One, to combine? Okay. Okay. This in the last question. Yes, go ahead, Nancy. Say, I, I think. A part of me also, it's sort of one part naive and one part trying not to have sort of the Northern savior complex that I would posit like someone like Ida May, if that, if I'm remembering that name, I read this book like two years ago, but it, I absolutely loved it. Like it was one of those books that for five years and on, I'd said like, this is the book you have to read. Yeah. I would posit she in some level would be okay. Like she was such a strong person she was strong enough to make the move, but if she hadn't made that move, she's the kind of person that best in her control and some stuff was not in her control, she'd find her way and she'd do what she could for her family and to keep them safe or to get them by. And the idea that like, you know, yes, yeah, some of these people might have lost their lives, they might not have survived, but the fact is people did survive and people do find ways and people do, you know, she could have been, you know, in a civil rights movement in her hometown, you know, decades later, but she had already left. And she had people like her and her family were people not related to her like her who stayed where they were. And so when you flip it and say like, how was their life different? It's like we've been saying, you know, some things were great. You know, there was a kind of new autonomy, a kind of new security or safety, but then there were different problems, right? There were different challenges. Yeah. You lost your, your mega, you know, some people, I'm always envious of these people have these sort of mega families. They have literally like a town that they're related to. Everybody is looking out for everybody. Now, everybody couldn't control the bad behaved redneck down the street, unfortunately, but everybody was at least there supporting everybody else and either keeping an eye on them or helping them on the back end or trying to prevent things on the front end. And that, that stuff, some of that disappeared. You know, some of it came with, you know, and so instead, like you could say it about immigrants where we, you know, sometimes like my father's from Italy, he moved to a town where half the town were his cousins, you know, it's in Connecticut, he's from Italy, but they follow each other, they provide a support group. So there are groups in the larger immigrant history and in the great migration where towns reform almost and families do move near each other, but there's a huge amount of lost, um, you know, family connection community that you, in the best sense, you put together a new one or you reform some of it or you find a substitute for it, but they did leave something behind. I mean, you know, one of the reasons you go back is they did leave stuff behind and that had its own potential protective power. It, had, it couldn't protect you from everything, right. but it, it was a, it traded, right? I mean, I don't think it's ever, and now we're saved and now it's all good. I mean, right. I, you know, we'd like to think, yeah. oh, you know, everything was changed for the better, but you just, you had to put up with different challenges and different you know, you know, in, in our yeah, family, different heartbreaks, you know, you had a different heartbreak, but right. Mm -hmm. in, in our family, to your point, uh, in our family, it's, it's amazing to me because both sides of my family, they never went back. Like I visited, um, 
Bessemer, Alabama, as an adult myself, I've never, I, I have, I'm, this summer will be the first time I'm going to a family reunion. I found, we found some cousins and I'm going to go to a family reunion in Goldsboro in, uh, we're having a family reunion. I have a lot of cousins. I always thought that I only had, that my grandfather only had uh, two brothers. My grandfather was one of, t of 11. And so we have a huge family that we're, we're going to meet um, for the first time in the summer. I, I can't wait. But my folks, they never went back on both sides. None of them. They never went back. They left and they never went back. Mm -hmm. and so, how, this, this afternoon, uh, the Senior Center at Greenwich has a short story every two weeks discussion. And we read a story by uh, William Kelly, a, a black short story writer about a visit to grandmother. And this, uh, all the people kept wondering, why did this guy wait 30 years to go back to visit his family? And since I was reading this, I said, because, because. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so many people up here just don't have any idea about the heartbreak of all this yeah, really, yeah, yeah. and the separation. And it wasn't because he, he just, he established himself as a doctor in New York and uh, it, his family in Alabama w were, um, yeah, it, anyway. Yeah. It, it's just kind of timely that today we were reading that short story and it just kind of tied in with this theme. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You know, uh, Adrian, I think this leads us into our next question. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. And um, that, because it's, we yeah, because sort we're of, kind of sort of going there anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we talked about Ida May, and um, we do, I would say we all would agree that out of all of the, the guys, the, the, the three, we would say that Ida May was probably the one who really um, lived the best life, mm -hmm. right? So what, ad, what attributes allowed her to achieve this happiness and longevity? What would you say? What were her attributes? Well, I, her attributes, well, she's very strong. Very um, strong. Very, very strong. And she and her husband had a good relationship, which the other two, uh, George and Robert, um, they had strained marriages. They were not supportive of one another. Um, there was a lot of strain in, in both of their marriages. But Ida May and her husband, both, I, they seem like partners in the right. In, experience and um she's just seemed very very practical and very uh she could take the good and and you know and not ignore the bad but she could focus on the positive you know she went she she finally got it kept trying to get a job she got a job she went to another job then she got the job in the hospital and and she was content there she was happy there and um, then the whole family got together and bought the, the house. House, you know, she was very much forward thinking and and family and strength. But I, I do think having her husband, um, you know, having a good marriage helped a lot too. Yeah, I agree. How about how about when when they bought the house? Oh, then yeah. she was walking down the street, coming home. And something looked different. Mm -hmm. The house, her, the the house on the block was gone. The house was gone. Did that like blow your mind? Can you imagine mm -hmm. somebody like, you know, when we moved to, um, I grew up in in South Jersey, and when, you know, we grew up in the projects, and then my my parents, I'm the youngest of ten, they brought they bought a house, and. It was in one of those, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the, the name Levittown. Sure. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, so course, Willing, yeah. Willingboro was a Levitt Town building type home. It used to be called Levitt Town. And so when, when we moved, we were like one of the first blacks in that area and our neighbor would put trash cans in front of the, his house on the sidewalk because he didn't want us as children walking in front of his house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He did not want us riding our bikes in front of his house. We had to like go into the street and then go. And it's just like, okay, well that was bad. But That's I- Jim I, but, Crow, Adrian. What's that? That's Jim Crow. Oh, exactly, yeah. exactly. But I'm saying that was bad, but to think that if, if someone literally <laughs> picked up their house and they moved it <laughs> because they didn't, I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. It's just nuts. It's, you know, one thing that occurred to me with Ida Mae, um, she had the wonderful ability to accept what is what is. She didn't get all disturbed like George Starling did and like Dr. Foster did. They were always fighting and angry because they couldn't this, that, or the next thing. Ida Mae seemed to accept each phase of her life as it developed and seemed to be thankful for what she had and accepted what she couldn't fight. But she was, the, they were men. And I, I gonna, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. I mean, the Better male husband. ego is, yeah. I mean, they're not going to sit around and just take it. Um, I think there's sometimes advantages to being female. Yeah. Nobody expects yeah. you. You're it's not bad. as much a threat as, as the men Good are. Good point. So. Good point. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, so, so, so true. Because, you know, we know uh, my husband would, bend over backwards to do anything he could do to provide for me, his wife, and his three children. I mean, and so for these men to have to sit back and and not even be able to, you, you know, you, it, it, it's, it's even hard to t think about, you know, like what happened with um, Dr. Foster when he was uh, younger and the, the guy asked him to find him some women. Yeah. And we know that just with slavery and just the, the whole idea that that the white people had access to the women, I mean, come on. This yeah. is this is this is it's just so for me, like I would hear from time to time when people would say, Oh, you know, so and so he has he walks around like he has a chip on his shoulder. Mm -hmm referring to young uh, African-American males or whatever, he walks around, he has a chip on his shoulder. Yeah. I, I mean, when you read this book, for me, I understand the chip on one's shoulder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and this was going on yeah. and continues to go on. So, all right, sorry about that. Lynn, go ahead. No, it's a good point. It's a good point. The other thing about Ida May, and I think this was George Starling too, they had the church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her they, faith. They, their faith, their faith. And Ida May and her husband were together in that. And George Starling found it later on, I think, right. that really helped him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wasn't George the conductor? Wasn't George the conductor? On yes, the well, he was a porter. Yeah, I, I, yes. yeah, the a porter. But I thought it was quite lovely that he was kind of the, uh, what would you call it? like a mentor sort of, right? He would kind of oh, he, see the people on the train. I mean, yes, he, like Ida May was kind of the reestablisher community. Like she had that quality of bringing the best of the South community with her. She alone could be the root of a whole new community, right? Because right. she was just that mm -hmm. lady, right? She was strong and stable and. She was the one who, like, there could be drug lords on the corner. And they say, good morning, Miss Ida May. Yes, Miss Ida May. That's right. Pick up your trash, Miss Ida May. Like, that's amazing. But that doesn't take anything away from the other guys who, right. like we said, you know, they have their own challenges. They have their own priorities. They have their own personalities. And they, you know, they're making their own way. And I thought it was kind of lovely that George, 
you know, I, I forget if his daughter wasn't happy with him or his family might not have been as stable. Right. And I don't know that he found the community that I you know, almost made maybe herself around right. her. But right. but he had, you know, he found his place. He took care of himself. He to some extent took care of his family, although I thought there was some fall that I can't remember very clearly three years later. But um, but you know, in his own way, he, you know, part of his community was he was the guy on the train saying, This is how you do it. This, you know. Mm -hmm. Put the yes. chicken under the chair, you know, like, like right. whatever it was, you know, he was trying to help people in his own way to be like a cultural translator, right? Yeah. To, to kind of help them, you know, get through the train ride, figure out what they do when they had to get off. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I thought it was kind of lovely. And, you know, the LA guy was kind of an LA guy to me. Like he was a ambitious, flashy, and, and I didn't think he, like, to your point, I don't think he had a chip on his shoulder. He oh, had no. confidence. No, I know. I know you don't think that, but I'm saying, you know, there could be people thinking he's obnoxious. Like he knew what he could do. He knew he had potential. He wanted to make sure he could realize it. He got out of there. He had, I, as I recall, he had sort of the class dynamics, even amongst, you know, with potential patients and maybe girlfriends or wives. Like he had a whole bunch of other little stories to tell and experience, but, you know, look what he had to get through. I mean, yeah. You know, yeah. he he was trying to maintain his own humanity and self confidence, and not let all this crap drag him down. And he knew what he had to do to do that, and he had to get out. Um, and, but but like, it's not like he's any less. You know, it's not like Ida May is the to me as much as I used her name. Like, it's not like she's kind of, you know, the the model minority, and everybody else is a lesser. I mean, they're all yeah. living their life and fighting their battle. And even when you said like she lived the best life, I thought I thought they all kind of got some I mean they obviously had other challenges but I thought they all had an well, amazing success story to tell maybe not as yeah. saintly as Ida May, Saint and, I, Ida and, May. I, and I guess what I mean by that is that by by human standards in terms of you know really getting the the American dream what the reason why they left the south was to have a better life right? yeah and I think between so did they the get that package them, I got gotcha. you and I think between the three of them, even though Dr. Foster might have been more successful financially, mm -hmm. how did it end for him? And not only how did it end, um, you know, he ended up wanting something. He had that desire and, and all of that success. And, and what did it get him? Did it still get him a, a really happy family? Did it get oh. having access to, the, to, to now going to Vegas? What did that do for him? So all of the, the trappings, it seems like Ida May did not fall into the trappings of the uh, what, what, what American, uh, what we consider like the success. Mm -hmm. She didn't fall into the trappings. So I, I think, and I think for George, um, pe people, down in Florida, probably thought he had a huge chip on his shoulder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because he because he knew and he was he was okay. he was he was a very bright man, mm -hmm. and that in of itself was enough to drive some of the the white people down there in the south crazy. Mm -hmm. So much so they wanted to kill him mm -hmm. because he he could organize and 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 he knew wages and what people should be asking for that was something that you know so he had a huge chip on his shoulder to to how dare you cross the line mm -hmm. you know so it was to the point where they were ready to they were ready to kill him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so right wow i mean i could talk about this forever it's already yeah, eight o'clock <laughs> it's already eight o'clock and thank um, you so much i hope that you pass the word around that yes book. honestly it's one of my favorite and most heart-wrenching books that that i've re ever read but um mm -hmm. it's great i want to tell you that uh lynn when is uh wilkers uh miss isabel wilkerson coming in april um she is coming uh isabel wilkerson is appearing up at at fairfield university at their theater at the in Queen april Center. in oh. april i think it's april 22nd and if you go online i bought my ticket I'm i definitely... have mine <laughs> okay i'll see you there adrian okay <laughs> we'll meet up so anyway definitely. really was well worth it 
And I have to say, as I said before, at the beginning of this, um, this, this book, I think is this in cast, but this in particular, because it's human, it's these three characters that just go right to your heart. I really think I'm going to tell everybody they need to read this book. And I thought it would be appropriate to close with Wilkerson's opening poem from Richard Wright, Black Boy. Okay, before, the, before yeah. you close there, if, if I can just say, I'd like to just ask you this. We read these books. Yeah. And I hope that when we read these books that, that we live differently. That's right as a result of reading it, that this is not just like, oh, wow, we have just fed our minds with some very important information and it's really good stuff. I hope that, you know, together we, we've, we've read Cass together, uh, we've read um, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy together, mm -hmm. and now we've read this. My, my prayer, and it is truly a prayer, is that we live differently as a result exactly. of, of reading this. So with that, go ahead, Lynn. I just well, I just well said, Adrian. Well said. And when I listened to Isabel Wilkerson today, uh, she 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 made the point, and I truly feel this. This story is about all of us. It's about all of us and opening our minds and our attitude and our hearts and our souls to one another to help one another make all of our lives better, richer. And I think she really establishes this. And so that's what I agree with you, Adrian. Going forward, let's put thoughts into action. So she got the title of the book from Richard Wright. And I think this says it and sums it all too for all of us. I was leaving the South to fling myself into the unknown. I was taking a part of the South to transplant in alien soil to see if it could grow differently, if it could drink of new and cool rains, bend in strange winds, respond to the warmth of other suns, and perhaps to bloom. And I think that's what Adrian is praying for, and I am too. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. And let me just mention, um, Pam, I saw your note. Um, about uh, Christ Church's uh, Sacred Ground. I attended that Sacred Ground series and it is something that- uh, It's awesome. You, you, it, it is awesome. So yeah. look into that. Uh, if you want They're to- Starting up again in April. They have another, another one. Uh, another one coming 10, up in April. Is it 10 or 12 weeks? It's 10 weeks. 10 weeks. It, it could yeah. easily be 20. <laughs> yes. With a lot of material. It's, yeah. a, it's an outstanding, very enriching and yeah. mind and eye-opening experience. I can't say enough about it. You have to be willing to give two to three hours a week just in preparation for each class. So I put that out there right away. It's and like a it graduate virtual? course. I'm sorry? Is it virtual? Well, I was lucky to be part of it live. Um, it just worked out. We were such a small group. We were able to meet outdoors mostly. And then but is it online now? Because I uh, no, it is. It's live and could be by Zoom, depending okay. on the situation. Okay. And yeah. Pam, it starts in April. I believe the next one is starting in April. Somebody else may be a member of Christ Church, and they may know. But we we'll find um, it. You look at their website. It's it's a, just an amazing program. You just get seeped, and you feel like you every single lesson you come away saying, "Okay, I have to do something." I feel like I can speak better about these issues. I understand more. It's a total education in race relations in everything going back to our, it's mostly a history course. I kept telling right. people, if you want an American history course, this is the kind of course you need to take. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, so Thank you Judy. Thank you ladies, Judy. wonderful job. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. So Thank, Thank you for, you for this. suggesting this book. You're welcome. Thank you for saying yes. Yeah. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Bye, Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.